So these cartoons summarize over two decades of research that people did, many people did, on glycocalyx and what happens when glycocalyx is damaged. So on the left, you'll see these, these blue structures represent the polysaccharides of the glycocalyx uh, stuck to the endothelium. We know now that the endothelium needs these structures uh, to sense the motion of blood flowing over the endothelial surface. So when blood is flowing, these structures bend forward, they amplify the so-called shear forces about 100-fold. That's the threshold that the endothelium needs to be aware of anything flowing over its surface and triggering biochemical processes within the endothelium. One of the, those processes is to stimulate the enzyme nitric oxide synthase. So when blood flow increases and these structures of glycocalyx bend more forward, they trigger the endothelium to start producing nitric oxide. At the same time, uh, these structures are also binding sites for important protective enzymes like superoxide dismutase. And superoxide dismutase is an enzyme that captures and inactivates oxygen radicals that are locally produced that might damage your endothelium and might damage your glycocalyx. So a healthy glycocalyx not only allows your endothelium to produce nitric oxide in response to flow changes, but also it captures enzymes that inactivate oxygen radicals. I also realized that the tight nature of these polysaccharides within that matrix caused that the effective pore size, the openings between the polysaccharides is so small, only a few nanometers forms a barrier against leakage of plasma proteins like albumin. So with a healthy glycocalyx, the albumin stays within the bloodstream, doesn't leak across glycocalyx or doesn't leak into the vessel wall. And that protein gradient is important also for maintaining a proper fluid balance. So the high plasma protein concentration on the luminal surface of glycocalyx makes sure you don't start leaking too much fluid out of your capillaries. And again, similar as for the red blood cells, a micron-thick glycocalyx not only prevents red cells to get too close to the endothelium, but also prevents other cells like blood platelets and leukocytes to get too close to the endothelium and to get close to the adhesion receptors responsible for binding the platelets and binding the leukocytes. So when glycocalyx is damaged, we've done studies uh, together with many others, and we know that glycocalyx is damaged by all kinds of risk factors that people are being exposed to, like smoking, hypertension, diabetes, aging, obesity, uh, you name it. When glycocalyx is damaged, you'll lose these structures, these polysaccharides, nitric oxide production will be impaired because the endothelium doesn't sense the blood flow anymore, superoxidismatase, enzymes cannot bind anymore to the endothelium. So there's more oxygen radical activity near the vessel wall. You'll start losing proteins and fluids and platelets and leukocytes will stick and start sticking to the wall when that happens. So I'll show you a few examples of the ex these experiments that led to these concepts. Well, this is an example of the role and the importance of glycocalyx in a large vessel, in large vessel arteries in the process of atherosclerosis. So we know that in large vessels near bifurcation areas, there are specific sites that are predisposed to start leaking cholesterol in the vessel wall and start building plaques that cause atherosclerosis. So when we look at these sites in more detail, we see that at sites where the cholesterol starts leaking, we have a very thin glycocalyx. And the glycocalyx at these sites is much thinner than in the rest of the vessel. So downstream, we find a very thick glycocalyx. Even at the opposite side of the same vessel, we find a very thick glycocalyx. So for some reason, glycocalyx is very thin at these sites where the cholesterol starts leaking or where the plaque formation starts. So if you look at the way the blood is flowing at these large artery bifurcation sites where the lesions start developing, we realize if you look at this animation, so the red color is forward motion of blood over the heart cycle. And the bluish color is backward flow to blood over the heart cycle. So you see, this is a model of the carotid uh, artery bifurcation. And this is the what we call the internal sinus node. Then we see that downstream of the bifurcation over the heart cycle, we have these very complex flow profiles. So instead of just moving forward, like in the rest of the vascular system, the endothelial cells at this site do not see the blood moving forward. The blood stands still or even moves back and circulates. So because of the nature that the blood is flowing at these sites, these endothelial cells do not experience forward motion of blood flowing over the endothelium. And, and also, those are the endothelial cells with a very thin glycocalyx. So when we started studying the effect of the level of forward motion of blood flowing over the endothelium on and the glycocalyx synthesis, we use these kinds of tools. This is a small flow chamber in which we can culture endothelial cells uh, and then close the chamber and put a glass a window to, to visualize what happens with the endothelium and with glycocalyx. And we can connect the chamber to tubes to control the 
flow of blood flowing over the endothelial cells. So if we do that and we have a normal level of blood flow, we measure a normal level of glycocalyx production by the endothelial cells. But when we lower blood flow to very low values as experienced by the endothelial cells downstream of the bifurcation, we realize if there's a lack of forward motion of blood flowing over the endothelium, it also has a great impact on the level of glycocalyx production. So because of their location at the bifurcation area uh, and being not exposed to forward motion of blood due to the complex flow profiles, these endothelial cells make much less glycocalyx than other endothelial cells, which makes them much more vulnerable and much more leaky. And then again, if we look at the leakiness of cholesterol at these sites, we labeled cholesterol molecules with a green dye, as shown here, injected it into the bloodstream. So the blood would be flowing here on top. On the bottom would be the vessel wall. Uh, and we compared the, the leaking of cholesterol into the vessel wall at sites with a thick glycocalyx. So the common carotid is a large vessel before the bifurcation area and then the carotid sinus would be the region downstream of the bifurcation uh, where it's a very thin glycocalyx so all of the vasculature with the thick glycocalyx the cholesterol would not get past glycocalyx so here's the blood flowing uh, here's where glycocalyx would be and here's the blue dye that we use to stain the endothelium so in vessels with a healthy glycocalyx, the dye labeled LDL cholesterol did not leak into the vessel wall and got stuck into glycocalyx. Well, in contrast, the site with a very thin glycocalyx, as in the carotid sinus, already with, within 10 to 15 minutes, you'll see that a lot of cholesterol already leaked in between the endothelial cells and started accumulating in the sub-endothelial compartment in the vessel wall, uh, which triggers the first step in the process of atherosclerosis. So we demonstrated with this study that due to the very thin glycocalyxes at these bifurcation sites, well, cholesterol is much more likely to start accumulating in the vessel wall at these sites, uh, making these sites highly likely to be predisposed to develop atherosclerosis.